Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming together to join in sacred fellowship, to immerse ourselves in a great body of wisdom, and to participate in contributing to the ongoing development of that wisdom. We are in our weekly portion, which is Parshat Bishalach, uh, which is in the book of Exodus. It begins in chapter uh, 13, verse 17. We'll read through our English translation together, and then I'll share with you a focus study about it, and then we'll open it up for our collective collaborative conversation about it. So if you'd like to unmute at this time, together we can recite the blessing, giving thanks for this moment. Baruch Thank you, God, for the opportunity to immerse ourselves in words, deeds, and relationships of Torah. I'll share with you the opening verses of our Torah portion, and then I'll invite others to have an opportunity to read as well. Once again, we're in the book of Exodus, chapter 13, verse 17. Now when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the Philistines, although it was nearer. For God said, people may have a change of heart when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people round about by way of the wilderness at the Sea of Reeds. Now the Israelites went up armed out of the land of Egypt, and Moses took with them the bones of Joseph who had exacted an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will be sure to take notice of you. Then you shall carry up my bones from here with you. They set out from Sukkot and encamped at Etham at the edge of the wilderness. God went before them in a pillar of cloud by day to guide them along the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they might travel day and night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. Kath, would you like to read at the very start of chapter 14? Yes, thank you, Rabbi. yud -Hey -Vav -Hey said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp before pi Hahiroth, between Migdol and the sea, before baal Zephon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. Pharaoh will say of the Israelites, they are astray in the land. The wilderness has closed in on them. Then I will stiffen Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them that I may gain glory through Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am yod -Heh vav -Heh. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his courtiers had a change of heart about the people and said, what is this we have done releasing Israel from our service? He ordered his chariot and took his force with him. He took 600 of his picked chariot and the rest of the chariots of Egypt with officers in all of them. yod -Hey -Vav -Hey stiffened the heart of Pharaoh and took the medications and your appropriate due at the time of service. If you are unable to keep this appointment, please call us back at 714-538-8549. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Press one to confirm and nine to cancel. Someone has their phone on, and it would be it helpful if you went on me. Your appointment has been confirmed. If you have additional questions. Thank you. Right. Okay. Um, what is this we have done releasing Israel from our service? He ordered his chariot and his, took his force with him. He took 600 of his picked chariots and the rest of the chariots of Egypt with officers in all of them. yod -Hey vav -Hey stiffened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he gave chase to the Israelites. As the Israelites were departing defiantly, the Egyptians gave chase to them and all the chariot horses of Pharaoh, his riders, and his warriors overtook them encamped by the sea near Pihahiroth, before Baal Zephon. Thank you. And Richard, at uh, verse 10. Thank you, Ellen. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites caught sight of the Egyptians advancing upon them. 
greatly frightened, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, was it for one of graves in Egypt that you brought us to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, taking us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt, saying, let us be, and we will serve the Egyptians? For it is better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness? But Moses said to the people, have no fear, stand by, and witness the deliverance with Yureva, they will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will battle for you. You hold your peace. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. And you lift up your rod and hold out your arm over the sea and split it so that the Israelites may march into the sea on dry ground. And I will stiffen the hearts of the Egyptians so they go in after them and I will assert my authority against Pharaoh and all his warriors, his chariots and his horsemen. Let the Egyptians know that I am Lord when I assert my authority against Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Thank you. Steve, would you like to read a little bit starting at verse 19? Okay, thank you. The angel of God, who had been going ahead of the Israel army, now moved and followed behind them. And the pillar of cloud shifted from in front of them and took up a place behind them. And it came between the army of the Egyptians and the army of Israel. Thus there was the cloud with the darkness and it cast a spell upon the night so that the one could not come near the other all through the night. <clears throat> Then Moses held out his arm over the sea, and the Lord drove back the sea with a strong east wind all that night and turned the sea into dry ground. The waters were split, and the Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them, and on the right and on the left. The Egyptians came in pursuit after them into the sea, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and a horseman. At the morning watch, the Lord looked down upon the Egyptian army from a pillar of fire and cloud and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He locked the wheels of the chariots so that they moved forward with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Thank you. And Sherry, would you like to continue there at verse 26? Yeah, thank you, Rabbi. Then the Lord said to Moses, hold out your arm over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians and upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. Moses held out his arm over the sea and at daybreak, the sea returned to its normal state and the Egyptians fled at its approach. But the Lord hurled the Egyptians into the sea the waters turned back and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Pharaoh's entire army that followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites had marched through the sea on dry ground, the waters for, uh, forming a wall for them on, the, on, uh, on their right and on their left. Thus, the Lord delivered Israel that day from the Egyptians. Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the shore of the sea. And when Israel saw the wondrous power which the Lord had wielded against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord. They had they had faith in the Lord and his servant, Moses. Thank you so much. And Tony, would you like to continue at the very beginning of uh, chapter 15? Thank you. Well, then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to God. They said, I will sing to God for... He or she has triumphed gloriously. Horse and driver has been hurled into the sea. God is my strength and might. God is my salvation. This is my God, and I will enshrine my God, the God of my father and my mother, and I will exalt the God. The God, the warrior, God is his name or her name. Pharaoh's chariots and 
and army he has cast into the sea, and the pick of his officers are drowned in the sea of reeds. The deeps covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, God, glorious in power, your right hand, God, shatters the foe. In your great triumph, you break your opponents. You send forth your fury. It consumes them like straw. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The flood stood straight like a wall. The deeps froze in the heart of the sea. Thank you, Tony. And let me invite uh, uh, Margo. Would you like to continue there at verse 9? And you'll have to unmute, Margo, if you'd like to share with us. All I have to do is read. There you go. <laughs> okay. Started with, the foe said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I I will I will share my sword, my heart shall subdue them. You made your wind blow, the sea covered them, they sank like like lead in the majestic waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the uh, uh, celestials? Who is like you, uh, 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 majestic in holiness, awesome in splendor, working wonders? Uh, you, um, you pull out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. In, in your love, uh, you lead the people you redeemed. In your strength, you guide them to your holy abode. The peoples hear the temp hear the tremble. Agony grips the the dwellers in Phil Philistia. Now are the clans of Edom dismayed, the tribes of Moab remembering grips them, remembering grips them. Uh, all that all that dwells in, in Canaan are aghast. Thank you, Margo. And let me invite Jim if you'd like to continue there at verse 16. Thank you, Rabbi. <clears throat> Terror and dread descend upon them. Through the might of your arm, they are still as stone. Till your people cross over, O Lord, till your people cross whom you have ransomed. You will bring them and plant them in your own mountain, the place you made to dwell in, O Lord, the sanctuary of, O Lord, which your hands established, the Lord will reign forever and ever. For the horses of Pharaoh and his chariots and horsemen went into the sea, and Adonai turned them on the waters of the sea, but the Israelites marched on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Thank you, Jim. Let me invite Robert, if you'd like to continue there, verse 20. Yes, thank you. And Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses saying, what shall we drink? And he cried out and he cried unto the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statue and an ordinance, and there he proved them and said, If thou wilt dil diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And they came to Elam, where were 12 wells of water, 
and three score and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. Thank you. Hello, Jay, would you like to read a little bit at the start of chapter 16? Thank you, Rabbi. <clears throat> Setting out from Elim, the whole Israelite community came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after their departure from the land of Egypt. In the wilderness, the whole Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of Adonai in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, when we ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to starve the whole congregation to death. yud hey vav -Hey said to Moses, I will rain down bread for you from the sky, and the people shall go out and gather each day that day's portion that I may thus test them to see whether they will follow my instructions or not. But on the sixth day, when they apportion what they have brought in, it shall prove to be double the amount they gather that day. They gather each day. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, by evening you shall know it was Adonai who brought you out from the land of Egypt. And in the morning, you shall behold the presence of Adonai because he has heard your grumblings against him, for who are we that you should grumble against us? Since it is the Lord, Moses continued, who will give you flesh to eat in the evening and bread in the morning to the full, because Adonai has heard the grumblings you utter against him. What is our part? Your grumbling is not against us, but against yud hey bab -Hey. Thank you. And let me invite Wendy, would you like to read starting at verse 9? And of course, you'll need to unmute. Moses said to Joshua, pick some men for us and go out and, and do battle and with them. Chapter 16, verse 9. Oh, I turned two pages instead of one. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I turned three pages instead of one. <laughs> uh, let me get my... my uh, setting again where I am, my place again. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole Israelite community, advance toward the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as to Aaron, and as Aaron spoke to the whole Israelite community, they turned toward the wilderness, and there in a cloud appeared the presence of the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Speak to them and say, by evening you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread, and you shall know that I, I the Lord, am your God. In the evening, quail appeared and covered the camp. In the morning, there was a fall of dew about the camp. When the fall of dew lifted there, over the surface of the wilderness lay a fine and flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, that is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each of you requires to eat, an omer to a person for as many of you as there are. Each of you shall fetch for those in his tent. Thank you so much. And Dan, would you like to read a little bit starting in verse 17? Thank you, Rabbi. Yeah. The Israelites did so, gathering much, uh, gathering much, some little. But when they measured it by the Omer, he who had gathered much had no access. And he who had gathered little Dan, we've lost your, your audio. Can you hear me now? Now we can, yes. Okay. Uh, you could just start uh, at 18. Okay. 
you. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it until morning. But they paid no attention to Moses. Some of them left it until morning and it became infested with maggots and stink. And Moses was angry with them. So they gathered it every morning, each as much as he needed to eat. For when the sun grew hot, it would melt. On the sixth day, they gathered double the amount of food, two omers for each. And when all the chieftains of the community came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord meant. Tomorrow is a day of rest, a holy Sabbath of the Lord. Bake what you would bake and boil what you would boil. And all that is left put aside to be kept until morning. So they put it aside until the morning as Moses had ordered. And it did not turn foul. And there were no maggots in it. Then Moses said, eat it today for today is a Sabbath of the Lord. You will not find it today on the plain. Six days you shall gather it. On the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. Thank you so much, Dan. Justin, would you like to continue there at verse 27? Thank you, Rabbi. Um, and it came, it came about on the seventh day. Some of the people went out to gather manna, but they did not find any. The Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to observe my commandments and, and my teachings? See that the Lord has given you the, Shab the Shabbat, the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he, gi he gives you bread for two days. Let each man remain in his place. Let no man leave his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. The house of Israel named it manna, and it was like coriander seed. It was white, and it tasted like a wafer with honey. Moses said, this is the thing that the Lord commanded. Let one omerful of it be preserved for your generations, in order that they see the bread that I fed you in the desert when I took you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, take one jug and put there an omerful of manna and deposit it before the Lord to be preserved for your generations. As the Lord had commanded Moses, Aaron deposited it before the testimony to be preserved. And the children of Israel ate the manna for 40 years until they came to an inhabited land. They ate the manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. The Omer is one-tenth of an epa. Thank you, Justin, so much. And David and Susan, would you like to continue there at the start of chapter 17? Thank you. <clears throat> From the wilderness of sin, the whole Israelite community continued by stages as yud heh vav -Heh would command. They encamped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses. Give us water to drink, they said. And Moses replied to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you tr try Adonai? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock for thirst? And Moses called out to the Lord saying, what shall I do with this people? Yet a little more, and they will stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people, and take with you some of Israel's elders, and the staff with which you struck the Nile. Take it in your hand, and go. Look, I am about to stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, 
and you shall strike the rock and water will come out from it and the people will drink. And thus Moses, and thus did Moses do before the eyes of Israel's elders. And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah, testing and dispute for the disputation of the Israelites and for their testing of the Lord, saying, is this the Lord in our midst or not? Thank you so much, both of you. And Rose, would you like to continue there at verse 8? No, thank you, Rabbi. Oh, Amalek came and fought with the Israel at Rafidim. Moses said to Joshua, pick some troops for us and go out and do battle with Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Then, whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. Whenever he let his hands down, uh, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur, one on each side, supported his hands. Thus his hands remained steady until the sun set. And Joshua overwhelmed the people of Amalek with the sword. Then Hashem said to Moses, inscribe this in the document as a reminder and read it aloud to Joshua. I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar, named it uh, Ad um, Hashem Nisi. He said it means, hand upon the throne of Hashem. Hashem will be at war with Amalek through the ages. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. That's our... Torah portion for the week. Uh, this Torah portion coincides with what we call a Shabbat Shira, the Song of the Sea, uh, which uh, we read uh, beginning of uh, chapter 15. And although I'm, I'm prepared to go ahead and uh, share with you a little bit of focus study, before we leave the text, we have uh, Hazan Mark Thompson with us. Uh, Mark, do you want to share anything from Musically from from this week's portion, uh, but you'll have to unmute if you want to if you want to share with us. Yeah. Thank you for the offer. Unfortunately, I just had uh, an eye procedure and I can't read anything. Oh, okay. So, and I can't remember it by heart. Um, well, bless you. We hope that you recover well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Otherwise, I I love to do it. But thanks Thank for you so much. Well, then but, let me in, invite everyone to take out. You always the song next week. Yeah, next I owe you week. one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I invite you to take out the study sheets. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, this week uh, is all coincides with uh, the Song of the Sea, which we read in chapter 15. Uh, and what's really curious about it is that, of course, as we noted, as we were reading through it, there's not just one song. There are two songs that are being sung, uh, one being led by Moses and one being led by Miriam. And that is what I have here in number one on our study sheet uh, from verse uh, chapter 15, verse 1. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song, I will sing out to Adonai. And then some 20 verses later, Miriam called out to the women, sing out to Adonai. So one of the differences, as I note in the, in the, both in the English and in the Hebrew, is the difference in the tense, that when Moses and the children of Israel, meaning in this case, evidently the men, uh, the, the tense of a sing there is in the future. Ashira, I will sing to God. Whereas Miriam, when she is with the women and leading the women in song, it's in the uh, hortatory uh, uh, tense. Uh, sing, shiru, out to Adonai. So uh, there's a very fascinating uh, Hasidic commentary uh, that uh, kind of plays with this distinction between a future tense and that of the in indicative uh, uh, 
tense form of, of the verb to sing. And that's from Rabbi Kalanimus Kalman Epstein, uh, which we find in his work, May Or Vashemesh, uh, Light and the, and the Sun. So Rabbi Epstein was born in about 1753, lived to about 1825, and uh, he was uh, a, uh, the story is, is that as a very young child, uh, he would he would sell bagels uh, out on the street that were made in his, his parents' home. And he would, after selling the bagels, he was just drawn to the to the study hall as a very, very young child. And, and we listened to to sermons and teachings. And it was noted that he was able to just replicate in entirety uh, sermons that were provided by by the teachers. And so a wealthy man, apparently sponsored him to to get a religious education and eventually much to uh, and and on the condition that uh when he reached of marrying age that he would marry his daughter so uh, this is what happened at the age of 13 he was betrothed married this this rich man's daughter and then uh Kalanimus Kalman Epstein was attracted to the teachings of the uh, Hasidic Rebbe's that he, he came across. And he wanted to go into another town to study with one of the great Hasidic rabbis. And his father-in-law was dead set against this because he was a practical man and didn't think this was uh, proper. And uh, but his his wife supported him, and so he went and studied and became one of the great Hasidic rabbis, and eventually became the head of the Hasidic community within within Krakow. So he uh, develops this very interesting take on what it means that Moses and the men are singing uh, in or professing that they will sing in the future, whereas Miriam and the women are singing now. So here is an excerpt from his commentary. All the worlds and all creatures may be categorized as masculine and feminine. Anything bounded has both upper and lower extremities. In the future, however, the lines and the circle will be equal, and there will no longer be the categories of masculine and feminine. All will come to realize God's light equally. This is just like a circle dance, where every part of the circumference is equidistant from the center. Now Moses said, I will sing to Adonai. This was because Moses spoke while still under the categories of masculine feminine. For the light of supernal clarity had not yet appeared. But Miriam, through her circle dance, her hakafa drew down the supernal light from the place where the categories of masculine and feminine do not exist. Uh, I'm intrigued by this for a lot of reasons. Uh, one is because I'm trying to put in, in the overall uh, trajectory of our story here, the significance of what Rabbi Epstein uh, is drawing out from, from the text. Because the Israelites are now just leaving Egypt and they are embarking upon this great adventure of creating a sovereign nation away from their enslavement, uh, away from all the oppression and away from all the cultural superstructure and influence that Egypt represents. So they're leaving Egypt not just to be free, but they're leaving Egypt to constitute themselves as something unique and different from what they had been experiencing for hundreds of years. And so this becomes a great project, if you will, of what it means to create an Israelite nation, indeed to create a sovereign Israelite nation. And it seems as if there's a hint that at least Rabbi Epstein sees in this week's portion, that's a bit of a cautionary tale that it, it's a wonderful thing to shape a unique identity and purpose and place in the world. But he's also 
seems to be pointing out that there's also a danger to that, as if if that's the end point at which we are headed to emphasize our particularity, he says, that's going to get us stuck in a place that's not the true fulfillment of, of what it means to be a human being. And so he's he's using this distinction between uh, the tenses and the verb to sing to play out this notion about what where we should really be headed is to transcend all of these distinctions and differentiations and, and all these categories and to somehow begin to experience the oneness and the collectivity and the unity that we all are as divine beings. And he beautifully uh, ties this together by saying, and that's what's expressed by a circle dance, as opposed to anything that's linear, anything that's either vertical or horizontal. He says, to break down and have a sense of uh, the, the, the equality that a, a circle represents rather than anything that's linear. So th this is a, it's a very deep and profound, for me anyway, uh, picture that he presents. And so I was thinking about this whole notion about the tension between the particularity and, and the universal, which is an ongoing tension within Judaism, and uh, for sure. And I, I, so I thought about in terms of a painting, I thought about, well, one of the classic forms that a, a painter uses to begin to study color and shape and form and so forth is the self-portrait. And of all the great painters that ever existed, the person, the artist who painted the most self-portraits was Rembrandt, followed closely behind, by the way, by Van Gogh. Uh, Rembrandt, our scholars tell us, painted or created uh, 80 self-portraits of himself. Van Gogh, we think, did about 75. So what does it mean to uh, paint and create a self-portrait of oneself? Is it a form of self-obsession, of only seeking to have self-knowledge? And so the uh, uh, so I pulled up this this uh, self-portrait that Rembrandt did in 1669, which is actually the year of his death. So by the time he gets to this point in his life, his last year, Rembrandt has gone through a, a, a whole variety of stages. Uh, he has been poor, he has been wealthy. He has had a wife, he's lost a wife. He's had, after his wife died, he had lovers and he's lost his lovers. He had four or five children, only one of whom lived to become an adult, Titus. And then Titus dies before Rembrandt himself. Mm -hmm. He becomes wealthy. He also uh, descends into bankruptcy. He collects art. And then because of bankruptcy, he has to sell his art collection. So here we are towards the, his, final, his final year. And he, he paints uh, the painting that you have on the sheet here. I hope those of you who have the sheet had a chance to, to really look at it online to get a much clearer and sharper sense of what is happening in this, in this painting. Uh, so we'll look at the painting in a moment. And I also want to acknowledge that um, Rembrandt lived for, for many years within the Jewish quarter of Amsterdam. He lived in the Jewish quarter from 1633 to 1635, and then also again from 1639 until 1658. We were fortunate enough here in Portland a few months ago to have uh, an exhibition at the Argon Jewish Museum here in Portland of uh, 22 works that uh, Rembrandt did while he was uh, produced from the time he lived in the Jewish quarter in Amsterdam. And uh, neighbors, Jewish neighbors that he used as models, themes, Jewish themes that he that he uh, uh, etched and and painted, and it was quite a, a stunning exhibit. So one has to wonder to to live in the midst of others. I mean, all of his neighbors, those on either side of him, those who lived right across from him, these were all Jewish homes. Did that have some effect on him as to his understanding of? 
how wide or narrow the world might be. So in this painting, some of the classical aspects of Rembrandt are shown here. You can see sometimes, uh, of course, he is the center as the subject, at least physically, of this painting. But it's a good question to ask, what's really the subject of this painting? You see how he is physically there in the center, but there are portions of him where it seems as if he is either receding into the background, his, his fading and being enveloped by the background, or perhaps he's emerging from the background. He has a, a, a playful cap on. Uh, he often put on costumes from different eras to, to try out uh, different expressions. So this is a rather a jaunty cap that he's got on. He has uh, the, um, the, the brushwork in the cap is rather loose. Uh, then we have, there's a, if you can see on a, a really fine version of this painting, you'll see the, his hair is full of scratches. And then there, of course, uh, his eyes, his mouth, his chin. So the question is, uh, what was, what are we seeing? Are we seeing a man at the end of his life? Are we seeing a man who has experienced loss of people who are closest to him, the loss of children, the loss of a wife, the loss of lovers, a descent into bankruptcy, the loss of his art collection? Or are we seeing a man uh, <clears throat> who, has, who has seen uh, iridescence, who, who has tried to capture in his paintings a sense of iridescence, a sense of gleam. Are we seeing in his eyes a sadness? Or are we seeing a glint in his eyes? What we do know is that uh, Rembrandt was uh, profoundly interested in trying to plumb to the depths of uh, human experience. And indeed, in his book about Rembrandt, the art historian Jacob Rosenberg uh, writes this. He said, he had to know himself if he wished to penetrate the problem of the human being's inner life. He had to have some kind of self-knowledge, in other words, in order to achieve other knowledge. He sought to penetrate the particular in order to get to the universal. So this is, uh, this is what Rembrandt, at least as I see it, is showing us in this self-portrait. He's looking at us. He's looking at himself to, in order to see us, in order to access that which we all share, in order to access something beyond himself. So with that, if we turn over, I'd like to, to share with you where this took me and, and then we'll open up for our, our conversation share with you a little bit further. Number three, I have a poem by Ellie Siegel. Ellie Siegel was a poet and a critic. He was born in Baltimore in about 1902. Eventually he moves to New York and becomes a, a, an editor at a number of magazines in New York. At the age of 22, he won uh, Nation Magazine's Poetry Prize uh, for a poem called Hot Afternoons Have Been in Montana. And this becomes a poem that the much older poet, William Carlos Williams, de describes as remarkable and something that we all need to return to and read again and again and again. Eli Siegel, also in addition to becoming a critic and a writer and a poet, also begins to develop a particular theory, if you will, about art, and he begins holding classes about that. He develops a philosophy called aesthetic realism, which has these essential uh, three points to it. One, he says, the deepest desire of every person is to like the world on an honest basis. And two, that the greatest danger for any person is to have contempt for the world. And by contempt, he means the lessening of what is different from oneself as a means of self-increase, as one sees it. And finally, his primary point is that all beauty 
is a making one of opposites. And the making one of opposites is what we're all going after in ourselves. Now here's a poem called Our Very Selves by Eli Siegel. Let us, you and I, talk about the world we're in so that when we have talked, the world seems closer, dearer in closeness, dearer in light, dearer for us. Let us talk about him and her and them and that so that they all be means to us of being closer our very selves. Ellen Rice is the chair of education for what has become the Aesthetic Realism Foundation. And she writes this about Eli Siegel. There are two purposes that fight in us all. One purpose is to have contempt, quoting Eli Siegel, the lessening of what is different from oneself as a means of self-increase, as one sees it. The other is the purpose we were born for, to be ourselves through seeing meaning in what is not us. And that is the purpose to like the world. When I saw that phrase, to be ourselves through seeing meaning in what is not us, it reminded me of something that Toni Morrison, uh, the, the Nobel laureate in, in literature and great author, said about the power of writing. The ability of writers to imagine what is not the self, to familiarize the strange and mystify the familiar, is the taste test of their power. So I go back to what is happening in our portion and go back to what Rabbi Kalanimus Kalman Epstein said back in the uh, late 18th century. This notion that where we really are headed as a human being in our highest evolution is to imagine what is not the self to encounter the self, to know the self as a vehicle, as a mean and pathway to understanding others, to understand the universality uh, that we, we all share. So with that, I'd love to know what you saw and what you experienced in the course of our going through this week's portion. You raise your hand, I'd love to call upon you. Uh, Margo, please, uh, Yes, go ahead and unmute and share with us. Yes, Margo, you'll have to unmute. Okay, Margo, I'll come back to you. Let me let me go to Norman. Go ahead, Norman. Um, I really like this first attention to the words I will sing out to Adonai, and Miriam said, uh, "Sing to Adonai." And I see a couple uh, additional dimensions in addition to what you brought up. Um, the first is that Moses and the men. Ashira is in singular. It's as if we're going to be rugged individuals in this endeavor wow. in singing out to God. The Miriam, Shiro, this is plural. Uh, the women are going to be doing this as a group. They're bonding together. They're uh, forming community. And both of these are important. It's both important to be an individual and also to be a member of a group. Oh, that's Another awesome. dimension that I see, Ashira, I believe, is a cohortative form in Hebrew, which isn't a, it's not an order. It's, let's do this. I want to do this. It's a plea. Uh, it's an urge to do something. Miriam, Shiro, this is an imperative. And this is, it's kind of an order. So there's also the dimension of being urged to doing something and being told to do something. I am amazed at how much is packed into just a couple words here. 
<laughs> Thank you, Nora. Me too. I am with you. Thank you. And Rose? Thank you, Rabbi. Um, kind of hidden in the background here, the story about the moon uh, is kind of interesting because it's really a teaching moment about Shabbat and faith. Because, you know, first they had to learn that if you save the moon, like on the regular weekdays, you know, it gets rotten, you know, so you shouldn't, the teachers you should not be greedy. But on Shabbat, you can keep it. And, you know, so that they had to have the faith that it wasn't going to get rotten the next day and not panic about it. And this was like the first real example. This is the first confrontation that they have with Shabbat. When you think about it, it really isn't mentioned that I'm aware of before this. So this is like, you know, so Hashem is saying, is teaching them through the man. And this is, you know, like the object lesson. Here's the mun, and this is what happens. And using, and the mun can be as a metaphor for all sustenance and all blessing that you have to have faith and that you can not strive on Shabbat because it will be given to you. Everything that you need will be given to you so that you can honor and um, celebrate Shabbat. So, you know, all this other storm and drawn with the sea and dancing around and all that battles, but this is kind of hidden. It's uh, very significant. And and uh, I thank you for taking us back to the man and talk about uh, countercultural and, and talk about something that's so uh, culturally subversive, the notion that you don't need to gather every day. You don't need to work every day in order to survive. Uh, to it was, it still is in some ways a subversive idea today in contemporary times. Uh, imagine what it must have uh, been like in ancient times to say you don't need to go out and work and hunt and gather every day because there's a day in which. Uh, uh, God will provide. The other thing that you made me think of is the relationship between, as we saw in the text, mana as being associated with mahu comes from. Yeah, yeah, it's obvious. Yeah, man, it's because I think man is like an abbreviation. Yeah, mahu. Yeah, so there's a lovely Hasidic commentary that says, really what has sustained the Israelite people is not so much something that's material like this uh, that you can tell. What has sustained us is the mahu. That is, what is this? That is what nourishes us. That is what keeps us going to be constantly questioning. So well, it's you. like the French je ne sais quoi, you know, it has that certain Je ne sais quoi. <laughs> okay, thank you. Let me let me call imagine Richard. I'm wearing berets. Yeah, let me call on Richard here. Thank just, you. Just one little thing I have too, but I want to tell about one of them. And that is, this portion starts out by saying, uh, we're going to go the long way because if you see war, you'll go back, you'll be afraid. And the next sentence is, they went up armed with Joseph's body. And that's what boys do. There's a war and they're going to be chased. And it's not always the case that, that the power above comes in and slays the enemy, but by the virtue of the faith and skills that he gives through the armament, they're able to make their way as a group. So there's these two energies involved. And simply to separate them as male and female, I, I think loses sight of there's something that always needs to be synthesized about these two ways. And that's what uh, what Rabbi brought up at the Seder, that these fruits 
have each of these fruits have a hard edge and a soft edge. And how do you balance them? How do you use your strength without going over into condemnation? How do you use your powers of protecting yourself to maintain your sweetness? And how do you balance them? And I see that going on in this chapter. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. And let me call upon anyone else uh, like to comment. Margo, can you uh, unmute? No? Okay. Oh, Claire. Yes. No. Yes, no? Yes, no. please, share with us. Okay. I'm terribly confused and I feel betrayed. I grew up all my life and I can't believe I'm the only one who heard this, that Moses hit the rock two times and that angered God. Why? Is there no one else who heard that? And it's not true. Well, Margaret, we have yet to come to that second episode. Oh, oh, good. Because I, I, I <laughs> oh my God, it's not yeah. true. And I'm, oh, I'm glad it's true because I've heard it all my life. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll get there. But so you have a good memory. It's just a story that comes a little bit later, a second appearance of drawing water from a rock. So, okay, thank you. Thank you. I feel, feel very good now. <laughs> oh, we like make you feel good. Okay. All right. So let me call on Wendy and then Steve. So Wendy, please unmute and share with us. I, I, I found it. Interesting, still dealing with this individuality and community, sense of community all rolled into one. I I saw Moses for the first time doing something on his own without God's command in, in this. And I found that fascinating in that almost like he had gained a certain trust of himself through his own experience and his, I don't know if you say support from, from the Lord. And... And he then needed support from his community to keep going. And then his community was holding his arms up and supporting him as well. And so it went from the individual to the community uh, so that for survival, basically, uh, as one, all, all, all as one. And then um, I also found it a sense of, history we're going to inscribe this in a document we're starting a sense of written history we're starting a sense of written tradition uh and we are establishing our community by writing it now down for future generation uh and there's a certain sense of we are now more established mm. uh and uh that to me was was really very beautiful I, I I was very moved by that. I don't know why, but but I I was uh, quite moved by that. And then there's one thing I've been wondering about through all of this is so many people are giving and taking and helping and da da da. I haven't yet seen any gratitude anywhere yet. Does that come later? I mean, does that come later? No one has said thank you, you know, uh, to the Lord. No, to God. No one has said. Thank you to Moses. Moses has not said thank you to the people that uh, that when the frost turns to bread to eat, no one, everyone's just almost like still in survival mode. No one goes, oh my God, the awe of that, uh, the the beauty of that, the thank you. You know, instead, I guess there's still the survival mode of oh now we have food, we will eat. Uh, they, did it's sing not a song, they did sing a song of thanks for throwing the Pharaoh and his people into the sea. They did. They were thankful for that. I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. They they did sing about being happy about throwing Pharaoh and his army into the right. sea. They did right. sing. They were totally ecstatic about that. That's true. But ecstasy to me is different than gratitude. Mm. There's a form, there is some... And there's a form of gratitude that contains awe and ecstasy, and there's a form of ecstasy that, and awe that contains gratitude. But in and amongst themselves, they're two. They also have a distinction as well to me. Yes. So, so let's just think about this in terms of our own experiences, perhaps. This this is a, a people who have just 
emerged out of a trauma, uh, out of slavery, out of oppression. And uh, they've all experienced, probably in their own personal familial lives, a uh, sense of loss and suffering and trauma. So the question is, at immediately emerging out of that, is it likely that people will immediately just have a sense of awe and wonder about the world? Or, or is there some kind of uh, evolution that has to happen? Some some kind of uh, some kind of uh, transformation of the self in order to be able to experience the, the level of awe and wonder and gratitude and appreciation that you're sharing. I, I don't know. I I I I think I, I've I've known people who have suffered and immediately upon being released yes. from their addiction or released from their slavery they're released from their are yes. still carry with them some bitterness some grievance some complaint some fear mm -hmm. and, and some un unreadiness to accept the, the the freedom that they they actually have or the responsibility and everything so i, I think mm -hmm. it's a, i think you've raised some really profound uh points for us to look at so thank you thank you so much for that uh let me call upon kath and 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 then Robert, go ahead, Kat. Thank you, Rabbi. I was thinking along the lines of what, hi everybody, of what you were talking about just now in the, the trauma aspect, but also it's almost like going from being a child to an adult, like the different stages of growth from when you're very young. Little kids aren't saying thank you. They're just, you give them something and they take it in the, it's almost like survival level. And if you apply to that to a layer of, you know, traumatized children, yeah. it adds, I think, to it even more. But I was thinking about kind of the whole arc of the Torah is this mm -hmm. development. And it, I mean, to me, it helps me with some of the, you know, kind of do it because I said so. And Pharaoh's, you know, the way Pharaoh's treated and the way Hashem is setting these examples that are very black and white. And the subtleties kind of come into it. Right. Nice. So, uh, and actually, thank you, Kath, for, for uh, kind of pointing that out, that sense of evolution. We've talked before about the, the cycle of readings, biblical readings that the rabbis instituted for us and how this reading that we're, we're doing now, uh, the reading, the very first reading that we do in, in the first month of the Jewish calendar, which is Nisan, is all about the exodus from Egypt. That I mean, the Passover Seder. That's 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 what we're doing there, and so in a sense, that is all about birth, the birth of a nation, and there that nation is being is emerging uh, out of this narrow place. It is going through water. Uh, it has to be fed it has to be fed by some parental figure it has to be given rules about how to behave and how not to behave uh, it's just learning how to walk and speak and then you cycle through all the, the entire jewish calendar and then you get to the very final reading the last reading in the jewish calendar that the rabbis prescribe for us and that's the book of esther and in the book of Esther, God is not even mentioned in the book of Esther. And there it is not an intervening external God who is redeeming the people. It is Esther and Mordecai working together. Uh, to, so that is, uh, it seems to be a message there from the rabbis about that's what it means to become a, a human being, is to... Be, find the divinity, the sovereignty. That's the word that's used in the book of Esther. Who knows, but to, you've reached this point of sovereignty in your life, but to save the people, to reach a level of, of individual sovereignty, to be able to take responsibility and solve the problems uh, that face you in this world. So thank you for, for bringing that up. And let me uh, go back to, to Robert. Yes, thank you again for another lovely evening. You know, Wendy, I, I want to thank you for your comment. I thought it was really, well, thank you. really perceptive. Thank you. There's really nothing left to be said. I mean, uh, it's been covered since I raised my hand. 
A couple of things come to mind. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, chapter 15 begins with praise and ends with bounty and their struggle in the middle. And I'm thinking, you know, these folks came out of a pagan environment. And I know, I, I don't know enough about paganism, thank God. <laughs> but at least not in practice. But I know they had to praise their pagans, their pagan gods. I don't know if they ever thank them. But, you know, gratitude is something that is a spiritual condition. Mm. Uh, you know, the animals mm. don't have gratitude. They have selfishness and so forth. They have acquisition. They don't have the spiritual qualities. And gratitude is a spiritual quality that uh, mm. I, I think we see in the Torah and throughout human history including the present, humanity learning about gratitude. You know, I spend Thursdays with, um, I go to elementary school and I have a couple groups of second graders and a couple group of fourth graders. And this story with the second grader, I helped them with their drama today. And it was about a happy couple, but then there was this fish that was magical and they could give the fisherman any wish he wanted. He didn't want anything, but his wife wanted endlessly more and more and more. She was never filled with gratitude. And that's the challenge of the human spirit. And I think that's a sign of maturity and nobility when we have an authentic sense of gratitude, no matter what our plight or our wealth. And I, 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 I'm just so thankful because I missed, I, that went right over my head until you mentioned it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for, for emphasizing and fleshing that out a little bit further. Thank you. And Tony, did you, do you want to say that? Okay. okay. And, and Steve? Yeah. yeah, about the Rembrandt. When I was reading it, I thought, wow, this guy was the first one that developed the selfie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, of course, they didn't have cameras then, but he painted it. But he could also trace by look, going back, looking how he felt at different times of his life. It was an evolutionary. Yeah, kind of yeah, he and he painted a lot. We've seen, we've been in the museum in Amsterdam. Uh -huh. It's like overwhelming. You could spend a month there, and we were in a different Let's go back to Amsterdam. So, yeah, I mean, no, I, you, 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 thank, you, thank you for taking us back to our artists because one of the profound things about that captivates me anyway about Rembrandt is not just his technique of light and shadow. And shading and so forth, but the humanity that he conveys, and and what our um, art historian uh, Jacob Rosenberg is is pointing out is that he accessed that by going deep with it himself, uh, not just to understand himself, but to go beyond himself to imagine otherness, and and I think that that is what um, Rabbi Epstein is also pointing out is that it's one thing to discover, to know something about oneself, but to go beyond oneself to discover uh, what is not the self, which is what uh, Eli, Eli Siegel and Toni Morrison are also pointing us towards, is, is to have the imagination to experience what is not the self. It is uh, takes us to a to a higher plane. So, uh, anyone else want to to share any kind of, Sherry, please. One of the things that's always troubled me about the uh, the Egyptians drowning, and there's really nothing in the in the passage that tells you how that impacted the Israelites. I mean, they had been in bondage for what four hundred years or something like that, and then they see the enemy, and we don't know how many how many troops were there, but it, it's a sizable amount, I'm assuming. I don't know what it is. But to see maybe hundreds, thousands, I don't know how many of those soldiers with their chariots and, uh, you know, to be drowning and then to, there's no, how it impacted uh, these people that had, you know, you pointed out have been tra traumatized people. These people had, a, a pre these, um, this army was representative of a, of oppression for for hundreds of years, 
you know, passed down trauma from one generation to the next. And yet they're destroyed, they move on, they carry trauma with them. And who knows what's in the minds of individual Israelites as they're seeing these these uh people that yeah. probably, you know, I'm just I'm just wondering so, what they thought. And and the chariots themselves, you know, the uh, you know, horses. the and the horses and whatnot, you know, um, you know, representing for the times, vast amounts of wealth. So I'm so glad that you, you raised this point because it it got gets me to thinking how profound and sacred this text really is because it doesn't tell us what the Israelites were thinking. Because what does that, what does it do? What does the text do by not telling us what they were doing, what they were feeling and responding to it. What what the text then does is it gets us to doing what you were just doing, right. which is beginning to wonder. And the responses that we then have by trying to fill in what that experience must have been like is going to change probably from generation to generation, from throughout from century to century. And that's that's what you see in the in the commentaries. There'll be some commentaries that will have well, this is what how the Israelites responded to it. And, and then it'll, it'll be, you know, very different because we are continuing to respond to the text as a way of trying to explore ourselves and how we are responding to the situation rather than the text prescribing for us how we should be responding to it, you know, by, te by telling us how the Israelites respond. So that's a very, it's a beautiful thing. Thank you very much for that. I know I've got, let me call on someone who hasn't spoken yet. Mark Thompson, please go ahead and unmute and share with us. Thanks, Rabbi. Yeah. A uh, couple of things. First, um, there's that struggle between particularism and universalism um, that you mentioned. And I think probably Robert could speak to this much better than I can. But of all the faith traditions out there, it seems to me that the Baha'i tradition is well on its way to the universal expression of humankind. I just wanted to acknowledge that, first of all. Um, secondly, uh, I can't help but think that there's a connection here, this story about Israel's struggle to nationhood at this earliest stages, to what's happening right now yes. in Israel, and the struggle that the Israeli people are experiencing in trying to decide what their nationhood is going to be like when this war is over. Um, and it's a, it's a real struggle. And I think it, to me, um, being able to, to use this Torah portion as a, as a means of exploring what it means to be an Israeli at a time of complete chaos. This is really what it is and it's what it was then too. Uh, Israel is going to be a different nation after all is said and done, they're talking about having this grand, um, this grand bargain that may come about as a result of all of this awful uh, conflagration. So I, I just, you know, I don't have anything important to say with respect to this Torah portion. I just want to suggest that I think sometimes it's important to try to draw a connection to what's going on today, to what we're reliving right now in our Torah study tonight. Well, thank you for that, Mark. And maybe one way to begin to conclude our uh, time together this evening is to say that uh, we live in a world in which uh, not just one nation, but I think much of the world is torn between a sense of, um, well, our, our poet, Eli Siegel, uh, put it this way. He said, all beauty is a making one of opposites, and the making one of opposites is what we are going after in ourselves. This We seem to be in a time when people are solidifying uh, and narrowing and uh, kind of retreating into silos of, of identity. Uh, and rather than some breaking down and trying to understand the other. And uh, he talks about this, this issue. 
of the, one of the great dangers, he said, is uh, minimizing the other so that we can elevate ourselves. And there seems to be a lot of that uh, going on uh, generally in the world today. Uh, yeah, the contempt, he calls it the contempt, the lessening of what is different from oneself as a means of self-increase. And so I think that that's a challenge. Uh, it's, it's what happens if you don't have a rather particular identity. You can be kind of lost in, in the world to have, if you have no sense of clear attachment, loyalty, heritage, legacy, if you have none of that, you, you can be rather like floating free in outer space. But if that's all that you have, then then you, you can lead a life that's full of grievance, and bitterness, and, and selfishness, and, and self-enclosure, and narrowness. And in our story, that's what Israel is leaving behind. They're leaving behind this narrow place called Mitzrayim. Uh, and they're going out into an expanse. And so here's that's the challenge. The challenge is, how do you have a sense of heritage and legacy and family and, and heritage and, and, and all that uh, have rituals and practices that, that continue to reinforce that identity in a way that does not lead to a sense of contempt for the other. And it's one of the great challenges apparently that's been throughout history and it certainly is a challenge that we're all experiencing now. And I'll, I'll say this, I'm very grateful uh, to be among a group of people who are constantly trying to imagine what is not the self. Uh, God bless you all. I, I look forward to our regathering. Um, and you all be well and take care of yourselves and one another. Be well, everyone. Thank, nice. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.